Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. Thanks for joining. Hope you are doing well wherever you are. In this episode, I have a chance to catch up with Noriko Shindo, who goes by Nori, and her startup called Hue, which she is COO. And it's a way for foodies and、uh, people to share their favorite places to eat and hang out, which has a more meaningful reference point、uh, that you can trust and you can build your community. Recently, I was、uh, listening to a great podcast by Pod Save America、uh, where they were interviewing a researcher, Dr. Edward Singerland in Canada, who has been researching how、um, our relationship with alcohol has changed over history. And、uh, the discussion was about how a lot of young people in Gen Z. Are going sober and not drinking. And one of the、uh, effects of that is that not meeting up socially. And、uh, this Dr. Edward Singerland was talking about the dangers of、uh, isolation and not having occasions to go and meet socially.、Um, so、uh, it's great to still see. Uh, apps and startups which are focused on ways to build community and to share information, and to even if you don't meet in person, to find a way to share things with each other which we find meaningful and true. And I think we need more of that in this world. So I hope you'll. Um, enjoy this episode and check out the Hue app and see if it might be something you would like to use to build your community of places that you care about and you want other people to visit and you want to visit their places.、Um, so it's an interesting concept and I wish her all the best. Thanks again for joining, and if you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear them. Please reach out on social media. Or write them below. Hi, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Seek Sustainable Japan. And Happy New Year 2024. This is the first episode of 2024, and I'm so excited to have my good friend Noriko Shindo joining today. Thanks, Nori. Thank you for having me, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How's it going so far? It's good. We had a six day sprint with both kids at home, so no rest, but it was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny, isn't it? When the kids are off and then you're like, you're kind of looking forward to, oh, it's so great to have them home. And then toward the end of the vacation, you're looking forward to school starting again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, Nodi, you have been on the show before, Seek Sustainable Japan here. Uh, talking about your startups.、Uh, you did a workshop for me during COVID. Do you remember that? Yeah, that was fun. Middle Eastern cooking, and that was so fun. So I've worked with you a few times. We also did like a panel for Women Inspire before we were able to do in person. So thank you so much. You're always being so generous with your time. No, no, thank you for, for having me. It's always a pleasure. Now, you have gone from the corporate world,、uh, working in banking at Citi, working in sales and management at Amazon, and then launching your own、uh, sustainable startup, Echo Local. And then now, Hue. Now, Hue is a really exciting app we're going to talk more about.、Um, how is it just in general, like comparing? Working for corporate versus a startup,、uh, being an entrepreneur versus working as a part of a, a corporate unit. Are you enjoying it more? Yeah. <laughs> the, the short answer is yes.、Um, I think the biggest eye opener for me is I'm super risk averse. Like, ask my family, ask my husband, especially. I don't actually like to take risks. So I thought corporate life was for me and I loved it as well. I, I really enjoyed 
both companies and the many roles I had. And at one point, I remember saying to my now husband, oh my God, this is the best manager, the best role. And this was when I was in Amazon doing um, internal consulting. So I guess I enjoy wherever I go. But at some point when I did decide to make the switch, I was like, why didn't I do this before? And you can somewhat, you'll probably know as well, but risk is, you can take calculated risk. Uh, you probably do that anyway in corporate, but you just have to be a bit smarter. You don't have a manager to bounce it off with. You have, you know, you have less things like resources like that, but in general, it's similar, but you just get more freedom because you get to do what you, I'm not saying what you want, but you know, if you want to try an idea, go try an idea um things like that whereas in corporate if you have an idea you have to pitch it to your manager then he asks you to write a six page document in amazon at least um and then that has to go through like five levels of um you know meetings approvals before anybody gives you a budget to even try it whereas startup it's like i have an idea it makes sense let's try it tomorrow or next week um and then if it doesn't work it doesn't work but that's fine you find out like very fast <laughs> yeah and uh, when you were doing, you did Eco Local, which was very community focused, sustainability focused, and then you did a cafe. And then you were talking about how running a cafe, a vegan cafe, a zero waste cafe, doing all the sustainable things you really wanted to do. But that knowledge also led you to this Hue app startup and how it the what apps were available or what information was available not only for the users but also for the business they were lacking and so you you feel like this is a a good app for uh addressing the needs that really are lacking at the moment right yeah i believe so i mean i still think that for me who is a sustainability venture in, in the sense that I could go on forever about this, but for me, it really tackles something dear to my heart, which is the food and beverage industry. And especially because I like eating, but all the more because now I've had well, some experience um, running a cafe before in Japan. It's, you know, I know both sides, the frustration of not being able to find a place that you really enjoy. And then also um, seeing as a customer, seeing the really great places just go down because of whatever. And then as a business or the, being on the F&B side, the frustration of not being able to, to keep it running, even though your customers loved, which, which actually, you know, thankfully happened to, to our cafe um, back in when we did it uh, in Tokyo. But despite that, nailing, you know, tastes, people loved it. There was a lot of repeats, good reviews, etc. Why did we have to go down? It was it was aspects other than the food, the ambience, the service, things that you know should matter. We nailed it, and yet it's all these other things. You have to get the marketing right, and and then you know realizing that marketing is is basically about cash or skill, and to get the skill you need the cash. So basically, it's if you have the cash as a small and new business, then yeah, even if your taste is uh, mediocre, you'll get by. But if you don't have that, then whatever your taste or levels or uniqueness is, it's really tough in today's world. And, you know, that's kind of the frustration that I, I had both as a customer, a consuming end, but also as, as somebody who has, it's only once, but, you know, um, experience managing a cafe. Um, and that kind of led me to, to Hue, which um, hopefully will diversify uh, where people eat out because, you know, you can really find what's good for you, not what Tabelogu tells you is great or not what this random person on Google review tells is great, but, or what's on TV in the case of Japan where, you know, you see a queue, it's what you will love. And then that should diversify. And also it should not make it reliant on how good is the business at marketing, right? It's how good is the business at doing what they should be doing, which is great food, service, uniqueness, this kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I had the chance to meet you in person in Tokyo uh, at an event by Fabric last year, and that was so wonderful. And you mentioned this idea of the Hue app and how it's a foodie app. Uh, it was a little bit hard to get my head around until I downloaded it and tried it for myself. Uh, in general, can you give us an overview? What is Hue? How does it work? Sure. So it's it's a fun foodie SNS app um screenshot samples here and basically um it it helps you to find personalized recommendations um that's catered to your taste um as well as connect to other users who share your taste and the way that 
um, we identify you or let, let you do that intuitively is by allocating you a unique queue, um, which will sort of dominate your, your, your user face. Um, and here it is. It's a color. So hue is a color or shade defining your personalized uh, taste in food. And instead of saying, I, I, you know, I like uh, healthy, non-chemical, no, freshly prepared, no, this, that, the other, and kind of just getting lost in the verbiage, just like, hey, what's your hue? Okay, you're this, you know, and then you can sort of figure out um, based on just intuitively looking at it through, through color. So that, you know, we try to make it um, intuitive, we try to make it fun. Um, and also there's a social element to it because also you don't love your friends and family uh, for what they eat, right? You love them for who they are. And, you know, at least for me and, and my co-founder, John Baptiste, there's been many a times where we love our friends, but we've been too polite. Yes, that's him. We've been too polite to go back to them and say, you know, your recommendation was not for me, you know, so. Yeah, uh, this this is a screenshot of your interview that you guys did with US Insider. It was great to see that. Now, basically, uh, you guys started the beta version in October 2023, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, at first, it had a different name, Dokoni, right? Yeah. Which in Japanese means where's next? kind of thing, right? Where's next? Where to? Um, our company is still called Dokoni. Um, it's so Hugh, this app is actually our fourth uh, iteration slash third pivot um, since the the conception of the company back in 2022, November. Uh, so in a year, you know, company has been busy trying something, uh, maybe not, you know, kind of testing the market. And Hugh is our most recent iteration, which we feel like great about. Um, so yeah, at some point we changed the name because we thought, okay, we want to make this a global app as well, both for if you live in the States, you can, you know, explore your neighborhood, but also if you live in the States and you come to Japan as an, as an inbound, uh, tourist, you can use the same app. And so that was our idea. It's like, once we want to make it global, we noticed people were having a bit of trouble saying Dokoni. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which and if you've you, been in Japan for a long time, it's hard to to see it or hear it with the fresh perspective. For people who don't know Japanese, yeah. it is it is hard, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we got a great comment already from LinkedIn, Ed Thompson. Great to have you here. I totally agree with the point about cash or marketing skills having outsized impact on success. Definitely. That's awesome. Um, you seem to have now this was interesting to me you guys seem to have a presence on linkedin and instagram but you have not gotten on facebook and so your target is is unique i think you're kind of you're avoiding certain social media um that doesn't fit the kind of user that you want is that right uh, yes and no. So we have to prioritize like any any small startup. Um, I think it's a conscious decision on in the sense that um, our primary, let's say, target um, generation or audience is mainly uh, the people who live in in Instagram and also TikTok. We we recently have a TikTok account as well that we have a lot of fun videos going up. But um, so it's a matter of prioritization. Uh, it's not about being anti. Facebook meta, you know, it's it's not that um, it's just purely a matter of prioritization. LinkedIn is a bit strategic in the sense that, you know, investors also want to be global apps. So if we can commit, connect internationally um, and kind of build that brand as well. I know that on Facebook, we can also do that for Japanese. So that's it's also important. It's just it's a bit deprioritized for now. But New Year's. <laughs> I think I need to put more strength in that in Japanese. I know it's something we're lacking. Isn't, isn't that funny how Facebook is really important for business in Japan, um, but you have to do it in Japanese. A lot of Japanese businesses are invested in Facebook. Um, so that's something to keep in mind for sure. Uh, listen, Nori, I have found this interesting article that I wanted to talk with you about because it talks. it's focused on tourism, but it's talking about tech. And the five key things that we're going to see uh, for tech trends this year. And although it says tourism, I think it's very relatable to the kind of startup that you're starting as well. So let me just tell you what their five are and you comment on how you guys are connected with these concepts as well. 
So you talk about Hugh as being AI connected, using AI. And that's number one of their list is that uh, this year we're going to see so many apps so many things which are connected to using AI as it has improved so much. Is that right? Is that you guys are very connected to the AI mm -hmm. technology? Yeah. So are you like piggybacking on uh, other existing information like on Google Maps and then building on, on top of that? Can you tell us how you get the information which is in the app? Mm. So, um... For example, if you know a place that you love and you don't see it on an app, you can search for it and it will still come up. That is pulling from the Google Map API. Um, so that is how we get our initial data sets that um, our users are most interested in. That in the sense user generated slash, you know, we do rely on Google, Google API. Um, but we also try to um, strategically have a roadmap for not you know, relying on it forever, quote unquote. Um, also, our AI currently does not sort of rely or piggyback on, you know, like a, let's say a generative AI source. Um, again, consciously, uh, at least the full body of it doesn't rest on it. And again, it's a conscious decision because um, we're building the AI for us as a, it's our proprietary uh, programming. It's our, it's our product. It's gonna be our core product. Um, so it's a conscious decision and it just so happens that we're doing this in this wave of AI, which can, it's a double-edged sword, right? It can help in the sense that it's like, wow, it's another cool AI thing, or it could be, it's another one. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the thing about AI for us. Yeah, it's another one, but how you differentiate is really important, right? Um, like I've been following your updates on LinkedIn, for example, uh, you're asking for co-creation artists. So any artists, collaborators, illustrators who want to be part of this, uh, reach out and maybe your work could be part of the Hue app. I love seeing that co-creation. That's a great community building idea. Another uh, really unique thing, which I really bugs me about Google search, even if I make lists, um, I can't block what comes up on Google uh, and it often, you know, like you'll search for vegan and it'll come up with yakiniku places. And sorry, that does not, I'm not gonna go to a beef barbecue place. No, thank you, right? So being able to block certain chains, like you mentioned the golden arches here, um, that would really suit me. And I'm sure a lot of people have certain chains that just don't suit their way of life, right? Yeah, it's actually been um, refreshing and encouraging because for me, I'm not anti-chain, you know, um, supporting the, the unique ones. It's been encouraging and refreshing to see that a lot of users are actually using this, this, this feature, especially, so you can choose, I don't wanna see this store or I don't wanna see this chain. And actually a lot of people are using, I don't wanna see this chain. So it's, it's very um, refreshing to see that. Yeah, and it'll be more value for the user, but it'll also, like you were talking about before, it's more value for the business that is trying to do something different, trying to stand out for being more sustainable, and usually they're lumped in with other businesses that are not, right? Yeah. So for the business side as well, to be able to stand out with more appeal as why they exist, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that that was why you you started the cafe, wasn't it? To kind of to fill a need that was in the community, but also to really stand out from what the usual eateries or places are, right? Yeah, exactly. And it was it was a vegan slash um, zero waste or low waste cafe. Um, even as a cafe, we tried to really minimize the the waste in terms of you know, plastic, single waste, a single use and uh, like bio waste. Um, we weren't perfect, but I think we did pretty, pretty well. And um, yeah, I think like, it's always been a thing of mine to try to do something if there's not, it's not there. Like the, my very first entrepreneurial stint is not a business, but you know, the Vegino website, which was a free uh, vegan website was also out of the fact that back in 2018, people thought that veganism was a 
cult and that people thought I got brainwashed from studying overseas. <laughs> um, but the frustration was there for me because I knew that globally it's not recognized as a cult or a religion or something weird. Even if most people don't adopt that diet, they at least know, no, no, it's just another choice. So, yeah. <laughs> Now, I had the pleasure of visiting your lovely cafe uh, while it was still open. And I did a short video on my channel here of visiting the Slow Echo Lab Cafe. Um, also talking with you and Helene, uh, the co-founders of the cafe, but also Echo Local app. Um, now, what you guys were doing, which really impressed me, was building community as well as running a cafe. Now you were doing a zero waste shop. So when you walk in, you bring your own container, you can fill up on nuts or oats and things, and you don't have to have that single use packaging, which really still does not exist in most places in Japan, right? Yeah. Now, this is something you can search for, I think on Hue as part of it, you can look for places that support zero waste lifestyle, right? Uh, on Hue, we don't support that as of yet. Um, the reason is because right now we're focusing on where you can eat out. So it's not Ecolocal. The difference between Ecolocal and Hue in that sense, they both have map functions, but Ecolocal is more like um, where you can go for groceries. And yes, it also had restaurants and cafes because we wanted to point out where there was you know, vegan or vegetarian options. But um, for the most part, it's like, how do you get around your day-to-day -day grocery shopping slash in some cases like chocolate, fair trade. Um, but with you, the, the difference is ultimately we want to focus on every aspect of your eating. So it could be buying chocolates and groceries at some point. Um, today, we're really focused on where to eat out. So cafe, bars, restaurants, at food trucks, anywhere you go, get food and eat there or take out. Um, but yeah, I'd love to put in zero waste. Um, we are starting to slowly put in or label um, places that we are confident that do um, very sustainable sourcing, like organic, local, this kind of thing. And yeah, I do, I do want to expand on that as well. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Kisa Psyche in Hiroshima, who I have put in my Hue list. If anyone's interested, I am using Hue. Um, and they are an eatery and they have renovated an old Kisaten, an old coffee shop, which is another sustainable feature. They have vegan food alongside a wider menu, uh, but they also are the only zero waste shop we have in Hiroshima. So in that way, that sustainable focus, right, has, widen the net and i bet let, that reminded me of eco local because your cafe it was a vegan cafe but inside the cafe you were reusing old materials i sat at a table that was a reused old door that was the table i mean it was just such a brilliant design and you see a lot of that in other sustainably focused cafes and eateries i'm sure you're going to see a lot of like more ideas than just one in in each place right yeah yeah that's the idea by the way i've been to the psyche it's a psyche yeah yeah you i think you recommended it so when we were there we actually visited it was a very nice place yeah. that's awesome yeah so maybe that would be another hashtag uh search function can you is it a reused building right are they making use of waste in some way like that that's a real trend keyword that we're starting to see in more sustainable businesses right wouldn't yeah. that be fun to be able to search for like old traditional minka kominka houses you could go and eat in you yeah. know like sure. developing it that way also you know you can to, as of today you can also create hashtags so if you don't see anything and you know we already have a very strong interest in this then you can create your own hashtag because then you can pull up by hashtag as well um you know ideally we want to make it more of a stringent function but um the hashtags uh, actually help us to prioritize as well what people are interested in so just hint hint you know the more people create um maybe niche or interesting hashtags <laughs> could be could be a future you know feature or something that's cool um, Lord Crunk on YouTube has said, sounds like a cool app. My icon would be green. Now, actually you can't choose your color. Can you? No. No. Yeah. We had one user ask to change the color. 
So your color is like AI generated by your input, right? Yeah. Um, so right now you go through an onboarding process, um, kind of similar to Spotify, or uh, we took the inspiration from other music apps, so Apple Music. And with that initial input, we do give you like an initial hue, which yes, you cannot change. Um, and the idea is like your taste will evolve over time, um, as will our AI, the, the color is not set forever. So you may see it change a little, you may see that it sort of shifts, um, but we think that that's another interesting aspect because your taste or preferences is not really gonna remain the same over time either. Exactly. Like as, as you uh, explore more places that are available, your color is probably changing because your preferences are starting to change, right? People, people are changeable, just like apps. <laughs> we need updates and uh, reboots, I've noticed. <laughs> uh, now, going back to this top five list, uh, the second top trend they see, and this is not a sustainability-focused website. This is tourismreview.com, and they say the second one is green tech. How they notice that Google and Apple, for example, have a zero emissions target by 2030. How and I've noticed this on Google uh, Map apps, for example. Now, if it is wheelchair friendly, there's a wheelchair on it. Uh, they're starting to show which businesses are more sustainable. You see this on Booking.com, right, with the leaf icon. Are they doing something which is more sustainable there? So, uh, you, as a founder, you have this embedded passion for focusing and encouraging us more sustainable businesses. Um, so that's, you're right there at the green tech, right? <laughs> you you yeah. got another one, straight on. I guess so. I think personally, like I sort of changed my mind about eco, eco-friendly or, or social um, projects or causes. I used to think that, you know, you have to sort of do it if you believe in it and that's it. Like just hope that it'll work or something like, it's more of a, missionary thing and it's sort of turned into actually luckily and, and positively as well i think the world is waking up a little too slow and maybe we could go faster but i think you see everywhere google um many companies large companies are making pledges that we hope they can meet them but you know very aggressive pledges about making their businesses neutral or um sustainable and so i've come to this place where I sort of changed my mind about it's going to be these small grassroots players and communities that push for from the consumer side. I think it's we're at a point where actually we have those as well. But now we have the big giants waking up, governments waking up, many countries waking up. And so you can do any business so long as it adds value um, because you will be contributing in the way that you operate that business. Um, you know, so that that's kind of my take on it now. And it's, yeah, I guess we're also in the green space, but we never really think of it like, oh, we're, you know, an environmental app. Um, so it's interesting or, or social uh, sustainability app. Um, we just know that we are contributing to that uh, widely by having more users using it. And yeah. That's awesome. Uh, one collaborator, I would love to see you guys uh, work on a project maybe to sync your data in Japan and around the world is my Mizu. Mm. Wouldn't it be great for you to also, because it often goes together with great eateries, where can I fill up my bottle for free with clean, safe water to drink? My Mizu has, has done a great job and it's very sustainable and that would suit your app. Am I giving something away? Is this something you've already talked about? <laughs> No, actually, if Robin ever watches this, um, be great. To, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's, you know, details about data and whatnot. But yeah, if it's like powered by my Mizu spots or something, um, for sure, that'd be great. And it also helps the aspect of us wanting to support the tourism industries as well. Uh, because again, I see at least a lot more tourists walking around with their own bottles, um, which indicates to me that they need to know where to refill them. Yeah, absolutely. And I have, uh, that's one of the bees in my bonnet when I do tours and, and guide consulting and destination consulting. I always suggest my Mizu because it's a free way for these businesses to get people to come, you know, to seek them out, to refill their bottles. And you're bringing in new customers 
and you're reducing waste in your area, which is such a burden. There's so many wins on that. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be talking about Hugh as well when I do destination consulting, Thank right? Thank you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, better for everybody, you know, these kinds of things. It really helps. Um, so that reduce of emissions for the big uh, green tech, all the collaborations we're starting to see. Uh, number three on this list was 5G, how 5G is making everything faster. Now, there's not as much 5G in Japan, but it is set to come. Have you heard anything about this? Are we improving our network in Japan, making it easier to use apps? Yeah, I've I've heard both. And I don't know if it's because of my, I don't know, the, the connections or the community that I'm more involved in is, is most people that I know are sort of against or on the edge of having, um, you know, more... Uh, radioactive <laughs> signals, the stronger ones, um, that are, that's actually going to become our main part of the infrastructure. Um, having said that, though, it will be very nice to have faster um, apps. Uh, I don't know if we need to go any faster, personally, but, um, and right, right now, like, if you've used Hue, you, you notice that we're not, our app is pretty smooth and well working. Um, it's never crashed. So, you know, for us as a company and also for me personally, not really sure that we, we really need that. But um, I do know that it does help uh, certain industries, medical, you know, like there's other places that I think already could benefit, already are benefiting from. But I'm not too sure if the whole society needs uh, 5G as like a default infrastructure. <laughs> I think, I think as long as we get 4G sometime in our rural areas or even 3G. I got an interesting notice the other day uh, from one of the pocket Wi-Fi's that I use uh, saying, we're going to stop the 3G. Like it's, it's not going to be acceptable anymore. Just 4G is coming. So I think Japan in that way, it reminds me in the rural areas, we're probably behind the times. Maybe in Tokyo, you're going to have 5G. I don't think we're going to see 5G in our area for a while. Mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, it looks like you've got some unstable video feed in LinkedIn. Yeah, thanks for doing that link, L Lydia, because YouTube is always a more stable one. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that. That's awesome. Uh, so another, so we talked about uh, AI improvements. You guys are very embedded with the AI using the AI tech. Uh, number two, green tech. You guys are definitely, I would include you in green tech. Number three, about 5G. So that makes it easier for people to use apps. Um, and then number four is 76% of international travelers say apps reduces stress. And I think this is not only about travelers, this is about customers in general, that if you can use an app, often because you don't have to have internet access for the app to keep working quite often. Um, so it does reduce stress uh, for travelers or customers in general. And booking.com did a big survey. They always do great research every year. 60% uh, of their people surveyed want to use a travel app that promotes sustainable tourism and sustainable businesses. So although that's very travel centric, like that survey, I think we can widen that result and say that customers in general, especially after COVID, there seems to be more interest, more enthusiasm to having a lighter footprint, to promoting and supporting smaller businesses. Now, this is really embedded kind of in your core philosophy for Hugh, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. And it's it's encouraging to hear these stats because um, we hypothesize that that's not going to be the case for, for example, certain countries like Japan, but um, maybe not. Uh, I do actually recall that, you know, back in 2018 when I was preaching veganism, right, and one of the effects being a lighter environmental impact or footprint, everyone was like, what are you, crazy? And now what's, again, encouraging is that I have talked to many Japanese people who are not internationally, in the sense that they don't speak English, they've never lived abroad, whatever, um, just very 
sort of Japanese people, local people who've lived there and grown up here, saying, you know, I don't cook meat at home anymore to reduce meat consumption, primarily for the environment and some for health, or for some people it's the other way around. But just to hear people say that as a reason, I'm just like, okay, Japan is also, you know, not an exception. And it's very encouraging. When they eat out, I think they eat anything for most of these people. But just to say, like, I've reduced the bulk of my meat consumption or dairy or both or and and the reasons being because they're more aware just great <laughs> let's talk about that for a minute because that's always confusing to me like if i choose organic at the grocery store i expect to pay more uh, but i'm often behind people at the grocery store my basket is full of vegetables and tofu and you know like basic survival healthy food the person in front of me has processed food and meat and I'm paying more for what I'm buying. What is happening, right? So I really think in the next few years, we're gonna see prices of meat and things which are not sustainable, things which use a lot of plastic packaging. We're gonna see prices going up, hopefully, and healthy things like locally grown vegetables, organic vegetables, Gonna come down a little bit. I mean, that's my hope. But I, I really, I think the consumer is starting to notice the need for this. And when the consumer wants that more, we should start to see more price parity. What's your take on that? I think actually, despite what consumers um, want to prefer, uh, it's interesting for me because globally and economically, anyways, the processed food, the price, I think, will go up because, and especially animal products, um, even if the animals are raised in Japan, because I think 90% uh, plus of the feed that the animals are fed in Japan, they actually come from overseas. And so the the freight fees, the rise in petrol, we have wars go, two wars going on, or at least two, um, and also the rise in grains, like all the rise in the, the raw ingredients directly will impact the the cost of raising these animals even if they're all koksan and you know all the meats are, are grown in japan um you're gonna they're gonna have to raise their prices even if they're subsidized from the government i don't think it's gonna be enough and the government doesn't have enough money to top up the subsidization because the costs went up so interestingly despite what people want and this happened with eggs as well recently right so um animal products um are gonna the prices are gonna increase and i think the similar things will happen with processed foods because a lot of processed foods have um you know oils the the corn the soy based um flours or, or powders and, and things like that um along with meats all of which um to my understanding or many of which are actually imported uh, even if it's a japanese brand and manufacturer and everything is made in the japanese factory and so despite it, it's got nothing to do with plastic it's probably got nothing to do with consumer um, choices, but happy for me, actually, these things, I think the prices go up. Vegetables also, it's difficult, I think, because um, a lot of the chemicals, the fertilizers, the whatever, that is required to grow non-organic, unfortunately, that's the same thing. Um, a lot of it is imported. So maybe also these vegetables will go up, but then maybe the organic will stay because a lot of organic farmers don't rely on a lot of this, if at all. Um, so it's, I think it'll slowly, the prices will move, um, but it's, it's hard to say it'll impact because I think the overall organic, um, veggies or fresh produce grown in Japan is less than 1% of what's available, right? So even if those prices stay the same and everything goes up, how many people notice, how many people are going to make the change? You know, there's also this perception that, that organic is more expensive. So how many people actually notice, Hey, it's not that different anymore. Um, it might take some time, but just just overall, you know, globally and economically, I'm hopeful because these these things are inevitably raising prices of a lot of processed and animal products. Yeah, those are very good points. And I think um, it's always a good reminder, uh, support your local farmers. If you can do a CSA, if you can reach out to a farm that will deliver to your area, uh, you can do a weekly CSA. We do a monthly one for us. Uh, to famous Miyajima Island, the island of the gods. So it's perfect for organic farming because they don't allow pesticides on the island. So it's perfect. Uh, we get them once a month. Sometimes you get mystery vegetables and you're like, what the heck am I going to do with this? You know, 
but it's a good chance to reach out to your social network, get some advice. Uh, stir fry and soup seem to be my go-to for mystery, <laughs> um, but most of them are fantastic. And the taste is just amazing. Like you can't get carrots that have flavor and some of them are bizarre looking. They would never be sold by supermarkets because they're too ugly, but yep. they are so delicious and healthy, right? So there's there's a lot of complicated pro pro problems with our, our current food infrastructure and the fact that farmers, the number of farmers in Japan is just on a nosedive uh, really is a good reason to support your local farms, right? Mm -hmm. All right, continuing on this list, the number five is tech collaborations and integrations, uh, mergers between big tech companies. Uh, of course, they would have more profits, but they're sharing the tech uh, instead of having to reinvent everything from scratch. Um, do, do you guys, like, do you collaborate with other tech companies? Are you promoting other uh, tech? How do you get your IT people? There's a big shortage in Japan to manage your app, right? <laughs> There's a big grin on my face because um, so many people are surprised when I say that we just have one person doing everything for the tech. Um, he's very talented. He's our CEO <laughs> and also my co-founder. So um, I'm not a tech person. I don't actually understand or appreciate the full breadth of his skills. But um, from the little that I do understand, I think he has exceptional skill and talent as um, an engineer. He, he does have a lot of experience. He is also a serial entrepreneur and has been building stuff. Um, so, you know, he's the one behind creating our, our proprietary algorithm, the app, and, you know, this guy, yes. <laughs> um, the app literally went from, from whiteboard ideation to beta launch in three to four weeks, which when I say it to other people, they're like, what the heck? So I understand that he has very exceptional skill talent um, in this area. And currently that he is our only um, engineer managing basically everything. Um, and, and that's kind of how it is. We've, we've been lucky. I've also been very lucky to work with him because it's super fun when you can just talk about something, prioritize an idea, and it just, you know, you see it in the app like next day or in some things next week. Um, so it, it's been fun as well as a, as a journey to do this together. Uh, hiring more people, we, we have discussed every now and again, is probably going to be challenging. But I think. Um, you know, like my brother-in-law is an Israeli engineer in Israel. I have a few contacts in US and everybody says the same. It's not just hiring engineers in Japan is tough. It's like globally, um, it's, it's going to be a challenge once we get to the point of needing to hire more. Uh, for now, we're not, that's not the biggest problem on our plate. So thankfully we don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, and in terms of collaboration, I think our current one is just Google Maps. Uh, I don't think they see us as a collaboration. We're just using their available API. Um, but yeah, we have talked of um, and talked with other existing companies, not so much large giants. We've talked with um, a com like another startup that's a, a rising startup or a unicorn in the States. Um, and this artist collaboration that you mentioned earlier, uh, while um, if we were to partner with would not be, the counterpart would not be a tech startup, it is a startup um, that specializes in supporting um, certain kinds of artists. So we do try to get collaborations across because as you also know, it's good for um, visibility as well and trying to get our name out there. Um, but also we don't have to reinvent everything when we only have one engineer. <laughs> Wow, amazing. Um, so you just started a few months ago. You just launched it. Where are you now in terms of users and where do you see yourself at the end of 2024? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, so yeah, we launched beta in mid-October. We launched fully in um, mid-November. And I think in the first two weeks, we surpassed our first thousand users. Um, and um, right now, I haven't looked at it in the past week. I'm still on New Year's. <laughs> um, but I do know that I sent an email out to our community saying that we've um, got about 5,500 spots hewed by the community. So across the world um, and across like, I counted 18 countries and three continents maybe. Um, so that's impressive because um, basically all of that has been hewed by 
the users, not us. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. We have about a few hundred um, top lists, so top five lists. Um, and yeah, I didn't count anything else in terms of like reviews and stuff, but uh, interestingly, we've had a lot of people really, you know, hewing their places and going back to them and things like that. So um, encouraging start. And then 2024, you know, like um, our big, it's hard to say like we'll be here, but our big uh, goal for this year is um, starting to get paying customers. So we don't really see this as, um, hey, everybody has to pay a subscription to use it kind of an app. Um, so it's probably going to come from, um, you know, can we get people to start um, getting value out of our algorithm from the business side, for example. Um, but that's going to be our key focus and challenge. Uh, and hopefully by the end of, or not hopefully, by the end of 2024, uh, we will have paying customers that um, will help us to, to keep on going. Are you looking for uh, corporate sponsors? Are you looking for backing still? We are about to um, start our seed funding. Um, and we are open to whoever is interested to, to talk, of course. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, of course, our interests have to match. So I don't really have like this profile of this kind of investor or this kind of corporate, but um, we do, we are looking to get investment for this year as well. All right, exciting. It's uh, early days, but of course, so much work goes into it, I'm sure, every day. What does your day as COO look like in a startup <laughs> like you? Uh, what's, what's your morning to evening, plus your working parent, uh, you have to have work-life balance as well. How's it, how's it going so far? Startups are usually exhausting, right? Yeah. Um, wow. The, I don't really have a typical day, but um, we wake up. I prepare vegan bento for my two kids, the three and one, to go to nursery because the nursery doesn't provide. So that's kind of how our day starts where I'm making husband quick saw breakfast, which is always oatmeal. And they're out the door, um, all of them by 8.30 or 9. Um, and that's around the time I start taking a shower, <laughs> looking presentable. Um, and if it's a work from home day, then I'll just, you know, start my day at 9.30 or 10. Um, and kind of just go on until either I pick up at whatever, 5.30 or 6. Um, and then I have like this, it's people who have worked with me now know that I have like a blackout time from let's say 5.30 to 8, 8.30, where, yeah, you know, you can call me or you can text me, but there's no re response. You know, I'm just not going to bother um, just because I'm with the kids. And it's for me, it's not so much about being present. Of course, I try to stay present, but it's just chaos. Like if you, <laughs> if you have a three-year-old and a one-year-old and we have a dog, so we have like this, this zoo. Um, they're all chasing each other. We don't live in a very large apartment in Tokyo, so it's like, it's literally a zoo and, and it's fun, but um, just getting them in the shower, both of them fed, clean, you know, oyasumi, good night. That's like, there's no way I'm gonna look at my phone. So, um, and then if I have stuff to do, or if I'm feeling, you know, good or energized, I might um, pick up work again from let's say nine to at least 10, but, um, try to make it to bed by 10, 10 30, because our son still likes to wake up at five sharp, um, which we can't seem to figure out a workaround. Uh, so we just go to sleep early, but that that's kind of the typical work, work week, work day. Um, I really try to prioritize my sleep. So unless it's really, really urgent, like I won't, you know, stay on my, uh, PC past 10 or 11. I have done like a couple times, but I really try not to. And weekends again, ideally I want to fit some work in, but it really depends on the two of them sleeping at the same time, uh, which <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot. Um, but when it does happen, it's like an hour or two of focus work. But yeah, I try to focus only on week week uh, days. I'm I'm hearing a few key points there. Uh, in terms of making the work-life balance work, you have a very supportive partner, right? So you got to choose your partners well, folks. Um, also, having your own limits, right? Having blackout times, like you talked about, 
those are really key. Um, having that structure. So uh, compared to working in corporate, it, it sounds like maybe startup suits you better in terms of a, a working parent. Is that right? I don't know, you know, because um, so I did have a few months um, back at Amazon with just one kid. I'd gone back to work at Amazon after my maternity leave. And it was pretty similar to what I just experienced. So I think it also depends on your, if even if corporate, it, it depends on what kind or maybe your team or your manager, because um, at least where I belonged, there was no like, you have to be online by nine sharp or 9.30 or whatever. They, they literally didn't care when you logged on as long as you got your stuff done. Um, and I would have the same blackout, like I'd block out my calendar from 7 a.m. to 9.30 um, and also from um, a.m. and also from whatever it was, uh, 5.30 to then it was 7.30 because she would sleep earlier. But I'd have two, two complete blockouts so that even if um, somebody in the U.S. wanted to have a meeting with me early in my morning, I'd be like, no, well, the earliest I can do is going to be 9.30. So you can take it from home. I'm sorry. you know. And if they can't do it because they have a kid, then we'll figure it out. But I just didn't move those blocks. So for me, it's kind of similar, but I think it's just because I've been lucky, you know, to be in that environment in corporate and then to have, also it depends on who you're working with in startup. Like again, John Baptiste is, a, he's also a parent by the way. So, um, and he has a child who is also similar age to, to mine. So I think that also helps because he knows what what it what it's like basically um, to, to live that. Uh, so it depends on a lot of things, but yeah, having like a hard block does help in communicating that. Yeah. I listened to a podcast with you about, uh, being a working parent and you also mentioned you were taking care of your mother who had dementia. So a lot of parents, they not only have the kids and like you said, a dog as well. Sometimes you have your parents that you have to have in the balance, right? Yeah. Um, this kind of multi-generational lifestyle, that's, that happens a lot to people in Japan, uh, thankfully, because that is a bit more supportive. Um, but finding an outside network of support is that it's a bit harder in Japan, I think, right? Like finding babysitters, finding people to come and, and help you care for elderly parents, for example. Um, have you found a good network there in Tokyo? To, if you can't do it yourself in your core family, you can find some support outside? Uh, with regards to my mother, she's still very independent. So the dementia was just a recent find. And so it's more like just, you know, checking in on her. And I got her to move close so that it's just easier to come and go. Um, with regards to kids, it's interesting because I think the Japanese government is finally like, oh my God, we need to do something. So the speed at which they implement random cash points and random support is interesting some of them actually help for example like and one that we've used for our second child is they subsidized um, a doula which is kind of not just a babysitter they will also cook and clean at request and they just don't do multitask to to you know, keep the kids safe. But basically it's like having your mother or mother-in-law come and visit, but you're paying them. However, I think like 70 to 80% of, of their hourly rate was subsidized um, by the local government. In my case, it was Shinagawaku. So I don't know if it's all of Japan, um, but that really helped because then for only a few hundred yen an hour, we could have her for a couple times a week in the mornings and she basically cleaned the house, did the laundry, everything. Um, and that helped for the first year. And we stopped after the subsidy stopped, but um, we really needed it that first year. And so thankfully I'm seeing a lot more, um, seems a bit random and I'm sure it'll sort of come together, but I think Tokyo and Japan is coming to this point where they're like, we just need to really get like stuff going because if parents don't see that their support, like, it's just, our country's not going to have enough kids. Um, and I maybe you heard that there's been, um, I think, a legislation passed or maybe an agreement at least that the third, if you have three kids, which to me is a lot, but like, you know, then your your kids can get free university for public universities in Japan. 
like that's also huge um given that university is already suffering a bit financially right so um yeah i see a lot of encouraging things going on yeah yeah oh that's i think a lot of us listening to that just now are like time to adopt that first that third kid <laughs> get the university free right <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Adopt him is always good. Um, Business Success Japan on YouTube. Thanks for joining. Says excited to hear founders prioritizing sleep. Yay. Uh, limousine. Great to see you here. International accent. US, UK, French. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah Nori, you lived in the UK. You lived in America as well, working and then back in Japan, right? I didn't actually live in US to work. Uh, I grew up in New York when I didn't remember. So I don't count that per se. Um, but I did work in Citigroup. So, you know, I guess I had a lot of American um, colleagues. Um, and then, yeah, I grew up in the US from whatever my, my early days until I was like 14, I guess. So, yeah, it's a mishmash. <laughs> So have you ever thought, I mean, I think one of the big, you were talking about being risk averse, but launching into different startups like you've done in your career. And then living in Tokyo is of course more expensive than living outside of Tokyo, but you've maybe found a better balance with being around other people you want to collaborate with, being where everything is happening in Japan, in the, in the center of business in Tokyo. Um, but you have higher costs. I'm sure that was a concern. Did you ever consider moving to a smaller city in Japan or your Tokyo forever? Uh, that's a good question because we didn't really consciously, you know, say Tokyo or not. Um, I think it was organic in the sense that um, after getting my MBA in 2017, I came back to Japan and because I got my job at Amazon. So and we didn't have remote working at the time. So I was just, Tokyo was natural for me. Uh, my mother lived in Kawasaki, which is also relatively close to Tokyo. And so I came here. And then my now husband is somebody I met at MBA. And for the first year he was living in, in his own country, but then he joined me uh, in 2018 and just naturally felt that, you know, I'm still working at Amazon. So we start our life in Tokyo. Um, at some point we did discuss like, you know, should we go to Tokushima? I'm from Tokushima, um, you know, because now with a lot of remote work and everything, it's, you can, you can live anywhere. Um, but for us, I think when I, when I, when I pointed that out to him a couple of times, even Nagano, which he shot down because he's, he's from Israel, so he can't bear the cold. Um, so he's, I can't, I can't live in Nagano. I'll just freeze. Um, so yeah, um, we have talked about it a couple of times, but I think ultimately one thing he keeps mentioning is that. Um, I think for him, it just feels a bit far to live uh, outside of Tokyo because if he wants to go back home or if he wants to travel internationally, um, not all cities, but many places, you'd have to do one domestic leg or a couple domestic legs to get to, you know, one of the international airports and then go to, uh, for example, Israel. Um, and only recently do, do we have a direct flight. So back in the day when we had these discussions, it was going to be like, if we lived in Tokushima, you have to go to Tokushima. I don't know, Haneda and then Haneda to wherever stop transit country like Turkey and then go to Israel. And that would be like, oh, my God. That's, that's such an important point. How accessible to your international family, your international community you are as well, right? Tokushima, you could live in Kamikatsu, the zero waste capital of Japan. <laughs> I would love to see you guys set up there. Anyway, uh, last five minutes. Uh, let's talk your Hugh pitch. For everyone, why should they sign up? Why should people be interested in Hugh? Go, Noriko. Thank you. We just want to take the guesswork out of um, existing platforms. If you're screenshotting Instagram, if you're screenshotting Google Maps and you know have all these random places bookmarked in your phone that you never go back to, Hue is for you because you get personalized recommendations. You can save you know, all the places you want to go to and also where you love as a Hue. Um, and you can expand your tastes by connecting with, of course, our recommendations, but also with users of um, similar taste preference. And we've got a lot of good feedback on the fact that um, our recommendations seem to be hitting the spot um, and also the fact that when users connect to other users uh, they seem to also be uh, happy about the, the suggestions or the the, um, the color 
Uh, so it really seems to be helping. So if you want to just find a place that you're going to enjoy next without getting any disappointment, this is for you. Awesome. And I love the personalization, like we talked about earlier, right? You can block certain chains. Uh, you can really personalize your preferences. And uh, yeah, it stands out really from what is readily available. So I would recommend people to go and find your hue and check it out. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Nori, for joining once again. Yeah. So excited to talk to you about another startup that you're starting and uh, your work-life balance. That was really fun to talk about as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting. And being my first talk of 2024. What an honor. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Take care. See you next time. Big thanks to Noriko Shindo for joining the show. And I have an announcement. Our new backup music collaborator for this year is once again Casey Bean based in Ishikawa, Japan. Now at the beginning of the year, uh, this area, the Noto Peninsula, had a horrible earthquake. So we've all been focused on the recovery efforts there. And this is going to be a big year for us to get up and help with volunteering as well as to support the good organizations who are already there on the ground serving up meals and helping the people who are trying to recover. They've had heavy snow, so it's going to be at least another month of recovery. Um, but Casey is just outside of there. He always inspires us with his original songs and uh, guitar, so I hope you enjoy it. This year I've chosen Shadow on the Wall, which I think, like so many of Casey's songs, uh, this really captures my heart, and I hope others feel the same as uh, we enjoy the episodes on the podcast this year. So big thanks to Casey Bean, and uh, check out his Bean Pod uh, podcast. And if you look on Bandcamp, Dot com Casey Bean. You can support his work, download his songs, name your price, and keep his original creations coming. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. See you next time. Bird song in my ear, shadow of the window on the wall, sleeping still.